If you read young adult books, you have probably heard of the young adult fantasy phenomenon that is Six of Crows by Leigh Bardugo. This book is a number one New York Times bestseller. It has taken the young adult world by storm. It is extremely popular on book talk. It was recently turned into a Netflix show, at least partly turned into a Netflix show. The characters from it were included in the Netflix show that Netflix made of Shadow and Bone, which is another one of Leigh Bardugo's series. This is all to say that this series is extremely popular. I was pretty late to the game. I'm usually not a young adult fantasy person, so while I'd heard of this book and I'd watched the Netflix show where the characters were involved, I'd always like wanted to read it, but I hadn't actually gone and picked it up. I only recently read it, maybe three weeks ago, and boy, do I have a lot of thoughts. I absolutely loved this book. I loved the characters, I loved the heist story, I loved the way that the character journeys were tied into the main goal in the physical plot, and I learned a lot about plot creation and storytelling from reading this book. I kept having all these little epiphanies while I was reading, and then afterwards I tried to figure out why I connected to it so much, and I did some thinking, and I came up with a couple of theories and concrete ideas as to why I connected with this book so much and what other writers can maybe learn from reading Six of Crows. There are things in this book that Lee Bardugo does really, really well. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about everything that I learned as a writer from reading Six of Crows and share with you the epiphanies that I had about storytelling while reading this book. Please note that this is only my opinion and this was my interpretation of the book. There were a couple of little things that I didn't personally enjoy about the storytelling and there are some things that I absolutely loved about the storytelling that maybe another reader wouldn't love so much. These are just my opinions take them or leave them. And before we get into the content, hello, welcome, my name is Claire Fraze and I'm an award-winning young adult author who makes videos on this channel sharing the actionable writing tips that help to make my own writing better. I share different pieces of advice that I learned that really helped me, different classes that I took, different courses that I took, and just different resources that I find that really helped me grow as a writer. I share things that helped me think about writing differently, kind of like what I'm doing in this video by sharing all of the different epiphanies that I had while reading this book. I'm also a former teen author. I published my debut novel Imperfect while I was 16 and still in high school. So I make a lot of videos on this channel about being a teen writer and I interview other teen authors who share their experiences publishing their books in high school. I am also the author of They Stay, which is a supernatural thriller and the first in a series, and the author of They Whisper, which is the second book in that series, which just came out a couple of weeks ago. I love reading young adult books, I love writing young adult books, I love talking about young adult books, so without further ado, let's get into the content. So there were five huge lessons about storytelling that I learned from Six of Crows, or that I saw illustrated in Six of Crows and cemented some belief that I already had in my mind even more. And there was one really major epiphany, which I'm gonna save for the end of this video and talk about it at the end. But before I get into what I really, really loved about the book, I'm gonna talk about two things that kind of caught me off guard while I was reading that I didn't love about the way that this book was written. Because when you're reading critically, it's important to examine what you do connect with and what you don't connect with. Again, this is only my opinion, and some people really might have loved these things, whereas I did not. The first thing that I wasn't the biggest fan of was the false start at the beginning. The first chapter of this book is told from the point of view of a character who does not come up again in the rest of the book. It's not one of the main characters who ends up going on the big adventure. It's kind of, it reads more as a prologue as this character is describing an event that's happening that's referred back to kind of after the book picks up. But I found it very frustrating getting to the end of that chapter and then realizing that that character was not very important. I know that a lot of people love prologues and a lot of people hate prologues because I think prologues a lot of the times will serve to help create the atmosphere of a story instead of kind of introduce you to the main characters and show you what's really going to be at the heart of the conflict of the story. I've never liked prologues. I have never been a prologue person, which is why I think I didn't like the false start at the beginning of this book. I would have personally preferred the book to start with the characters that we're gonna follow for the rest of the book and have the information worked into the plot as the main characters discover it, not as a side character who isn't at all important in the later story discovers it right at the beginning. And the second thing I didn't love was the timing and placement of some of the flashbacks. Some of the flashbacks were placed masterfully. They were in the perfect location. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the way that Lee Bardugo used flashbacks later, because this really opened my eyes to the possibility of 
tension that you can create using flashbacks. Because a lot of the time, you know, you'll be reading a book and there'll be a flashback and it's really uninteresting because it isn't relevant to the story. But in this book, all of the character arcs and journeys really intertwined with the plot very closely, which I'm gonna get to later because it was awesome. But those flashbacks helped develop the character arcs and journeys that the characters had to go on in order to achieve their final goal. But some of the flashbacks were placed at times because there was this tension between what happened before in the flashbacks and what happened in the present. And sometimes when the flashbacks would drop in, I just wanted to know what happened to the character right in the moment. So I didn't like when the flashbacks would interrupt really tense scenes. For example, let's say you had a character who was, I don't know, scaling a very dangerous, very tall, uh, incinerator shaft and right in the middle before you even know whether they're gonna make it to the top there is a flashback about their character growth placed in the middle that one particularly frustrated me because I wanted to know how that scene was going to complete before we got the information about her character but at the same time I really liked the flashback so I think like the way that the flashbacks were used sometimes they were put in perfect places sometimes in my opinion I would have maybe waited until that particular scene was over and resolved before putting the flashback in but that is not any kind of criticism to the flashback itself that is just something that I thought while I was reading and maybe a decision I would make differently if I were the one writing it. But those are the only two things that I had about the way that this book was structured that kind of got me a little stuck. The rest I absolutely loved. So now I'm going to go into the five major lessons about storytelling and character development that I learned from reading Six of Crows. The first thing that this book did absolutely beautifully was make each of the main characters likable. I was rooting for all of them, even though they were anti-heroes, and a lot of the times they were kind of the bad guys in the situation. This is a really tough thing to pull off because trauma doesn't necessarily make a character likable. Each of the main six characters in Six of Crows had some serious baggage and trauma. But I've read books before where characters have had that much trauma, but it hasn't necessarily made them a very good person or a very likable person. And the characters in Six of Crows are not necessarily good people, but they s still had me rooting for them as they tried to do something that was not necessarily the right thing to do. It's a heist book. They were breaking into some place and they were trying to steal something. This is not what necessarily the good guys do, but I wanted them to succeed. And I was reading the book and I was trying to figure out why I liked them so much. So this is my theory. Each of the main characters in this book had a major fear, flaw, weakness, and thing that they are deeply ashamed of. Shame is an emotion that I think a lot of people innately understand and connect to because no matter what it is, all of us know how it feels to be ashamed of something. This shame looks different with each of the characters. For example, some of the characters were put in, well, actually all of the characters were put in situations while they were very young, which forced them to act in certain ways that they were ashamed of later. Or it forced them to do things to survive that they feel deeply ashamed of inside of them. Some of the characters have facets of who they are or abilities that society has taught them that they need to be ashamed of, which is something that they carry. And a lot of them were put into really horrible, heartbreaking situations by forces outside of their control, which forced them to do certain things or act a certain way or experience certain things that no kids should have to experience. And what I love about all of the different flaws and fears and weaknesses of the characters in Six of Crows is that they are incredibly specific and this makes them really compelling to read about because they're not just they, they don't feel like cookie cutter characters that are like afraid of the dark or afraid of heights they have a full backstory for why they are afraid of that thing and have lived a multitude of experiences which have backed up them being afraid of that thing but even though these fears and weaknesses are specific the emotions of shame or of feeling like you're different or feeling like you have to hide part of who you are are emotions and experiences that people from all different backgrounds can relate to, which is I think why these characters are so compelling and easy to connect to. And another reason that I think that these characters are so likable, even though they might do some morally questionable things, is because each and 
every one of them has somebody or something that they deeply care about. Even though certain characters might be motivated by revenge or money, those characters still maybe have a soft spot for another one of the characters or they are secretly in love with another character and it shows their humanity and their heart. And if they are motivated by money and gr or things like revenge, it's shown throughout the narrative why that revenge is very justified and why that money is very necessary. So instead of you thinking, oh, this character is unlikable and greedy, you are like, oh, okay, that guy sucks. Now I understand why this character hates this person and wants revenge. Now I want them to get revenge on this person too. So it brings you onto that character's side. So the things about character that I'm taking forward from reading this book is that I want to make sure that all of my character fears and weaknesses and things that they're ashamed of are very specific and all of their fears are like grounded in a lot of backstory and character building so they have a reason for acting the way that they do. I wanna make sure that they have something that they deeply care about, not just power or greed, but like a person if I want them to like them, like having some sort of human connection that allows you to connect with a character. And I also want to make sure that I justify any negative emotions or motivations that they have. As I said, like greed, I wanna make sure that that's justified, that the readers also see that the reason that they want revenge is very justified because the person they want revenge against is kind of a jerk. So moving on to the second big lesson that I learned from reading Six of Crows, which is to reveal character backstory slowly. Six of Crows was not only about the heist that they were trying to pull off. Each of the characters had to grow and develop in a certain way in order to pull off the heist. And so there were like two different conflicts happening at the same time in the story. Not only were they preparing to go on the heist and to steal the thing that they were trying to steal, but all of the characters were going on their own individual journeys so that they would be ready as characters to participate in the heist and potentially may or may not save the day. Every character had very specific fears and weaknesses to overcome in order to pull off the heist at the end of the book. And a lot of the things that they were trying to overcome happened in the past, a lot of like the past traumas and things like that. So they couldn't be revealed in the present day action of the story. They had to be revealed as pieces of information that had happened in the past. Something that this book did really well is include plot twists that happened in the past. They were able to get readers to be completely, like at least me, have like, you know, my jaw on the floor after reading a plot twist that had happened before the story had even started. It was just like a piece of information that was revealed and that changed the context of what was happening in the present day. It was like a whole mystery was slowly being unraveled from the past story and that readers were slowly getting to be able to pull together what had happened to these characters and had made them the way that they are and was explaining all of their internal struggles so that by the time they were at the climax, you had a good idea of what they were all battling inside. So you could understand the personal inner conflict that they had to fight in order to pull off the tangible physical conflict, which was the heist at the end of the book. This is always a tough thing when you are writing a book about characters that have had a lot of history before the book starts. It's a lot of the times why it's easier to write a book where all of the characters meet each other on the first page Page, and then the story ensues after that because they are getting to know each other as the readers are getting to know them so it's easier to work in different types of information and backstory there but these characters have known each other already for a while so it's kind of hard to work in all of the information in a way that is still compelling. I'm going to talk about the flashbacks next and why I actually think that they worked in this story but I think that Lee Bardugo did a great job not giving away everything up front with all of the character histories. So something that I'm taking forward from that is making sure to break up the different pieces of every character's history and sprinkle them in methodically over the course of the story instead of dumping everything all at once, because that would just end up being a very, very long expositional chapter on each character and would be a little boring. And I think that it's more effective to create tension by having readers have some questions about the characters and wanting to get to know them better and then being able to be satisfied when they get those pieces of information over the course of the story. So on to the flashbacks. I will admit when I first read the flashbacks in this book, I wasn't a huge fan right at the beginning. I just have a need 
knee-jerk reaction to flashbacks, and I don't like it when the action in the present tense is broken up by like explanation and flashback backstory. I just like, I, I want to know what happens now. I don't really care about what happened before. But I also recognize that that's because I read a lot of thrillers and I am a thriller author and I like, you know, like the in the moment kind of tension filled first person action scenes where I'm always on the edge of my seat. And in this book, it had a lot of on the edge of your seat moments, but I think that what made the characters so dynamic is because they had a couple of like, you know, maybe sitting a little bit farther back on the seat moments where you are really able to learn about them and what makes them tick inside of their head and what their really rich, interesting histories were. One of the reasons that I think the flashbacks worked really well in this book is because they all came up fairly naturally. Like the characters would walk by a particular location and that location was tied into a lot of trauma for them. And then they would get a flashback explaining why that location was so traumatic for them or a particular event would happen and then you would get a flashback explaining maybe why that character was so afraid of the thing that they had just experienced. It didn't feel like an info dump because also the flashbacks were relatively short and they were written in fairly present-ish action-y words, like you still got dialogue, it wasn't just an explanation of what happened, it was still grounded somewhat in like action writing style. So I think that that also helped. So while, you know, I am a thriller author and like I don't think that the kind of books that at least I'm writing right now would benefit very well from these types of flashbacks because I do think that they slow down the pace of the story a little bit and in a thriller it might not work as well as in a fantasy book. I do think that it was a really effective way for Lee Bardugo to round out the characters a little bit more. But what the flashbacks did really well is kind of carry this sense of mystery. Like there were like two plots happening at the same time. There was the mystery happening in the past with all the character backstories that the readers didn't really understand yet, but was slowly being revealed. And then there was the plot of whether or not they're actually gonna be able to pull off the heist. And both of these things connected at the end in a really, really mind-blowing way, which is what I'm gonna talk about right at the end of this video, so stick around if you wanna hear me explain that, because that absolutely blew my mind. But my big takeaway about the flashbacks here is that they were short, they were relevant, and they were grounded in present language. Like there were still dialogue, there were still descriptions of the surroundings. They didn't feel like it was just that character explaining to the readers what had happened, which I think was huge. That would definitely be a technique to explore if you are a young adult fantasy writer though, and that is the kind of character plot that you are writing. The fourth big lesson that I learned from reading Six of Crows is how Lee Bardugo used point of view to conceal information. This is maybe one of the favorite things that I learned because as somebody who also writes from multiple point of views, this just kind of blew my mind and I thought it was absolutely masterful. Because all of these characters are doing a heist together, they have to pull off something that's very complicated. And when you have a plan, I hear this writing advice a lot, that when your characters have a plan and the plan is going to succeed, you don't tell the readers what the plan is so that when the plan ultimately succeeds, every single twist and turn is surprising and fun for the readers to go on. But if the plan is going to go wrong, you do tell the readers what the plan is so that when the plan goes wrong, the readers know that the plan is going wrong. Six of Crows told us what the plan was gonna be and there were many, many times that the plan went wrong, but there were also many times where the characters were able to come in and save the day unexpectedly, which always surprised you as a reader because you didn't know these characters were gonna come in and save the day unexpectedly because the point of view character had no idea what these characters were up to. So it wasn't information that was concealed from the reader, this character just didn't know that information. And when Lee Bardugo didn't want the readers to know a certain piece of information, she chose a character that didn't know that information to be the point of view character of that chapter. I thought this was so clever. There were a couple of times when the characters would come in and save the day and then, you know, it would switch to their point of view in the next chapter and then they would explain how they knew to come in and save the day. So there were all these like little reversals because all of the point of view characters kept getting saved because they didn't know what the other five characters were doing. That was super fun and exciting to read about. There were also some twists that happened like within the group where like some of the other point of view characters knew this crucial pieces of information, but Lee Bardugo intentionally chose a character who was kept out of the loop to be the person who is the point of view 
character of that chapter so that when the readers are reading it they are just as surprised as the point of view character is when like the other characters who are in on it already knew it and wouldn't have been surprised. There were some very crafty times where she was able to leverage point of view in order to deliver plot twists and suspenseful moments. So that's definitely going to be something that I carry forward with me because I write multi POV thrillers and I just, I, I think it's so crafty. It requires a little bit of piecing everything together like a puzzle, but the result when it's done well is just so good. I just, I remember I was like, at multiple times reading this book, I just had to close it and be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that that is how she was able to deliver that effect. It was so brilliant. And finally, this is the main huge giant epiphany that I had while reading Six of Crows is that there were two separate plots. There was the character growth plot and the physical heist plot. And during the climax, both of these plots intersected together. They became one plot. Every single character had to overcome their greatest weakness, their greatest insecurity, their greatest source of shame in order to pull off the physical conflict that they were trying to pull off. They had to overcome their internal fight in order to win their physical world fight. Every single character had to face themselves before facing the physical conflict and goal of the heist. It was really crafty how Lee Bardugo put this together because it was as if she came up with the perfect situation to put every single character to the test and wove it together in a chain of events which required every single character to have a huge character growth moment and face themselves and overcome their internal conflict in order to physically move them closer to achieving the heist goal. I put all of this together on a chart I'm gonna show the chart here. They have the actual physical spoilers for Six of Crows on them, so just like skip forward in the video if you don't wanna read this thing I'm about to put up on the screen. But as you can see now on this thing on the screen, I have each of the, I mean, I, I only used the five characters because I didn't really, I, I feel like we didn't really get to know Wylan that much in Six of Crows, but for the other five, they had very f tangible, worst fears and weaknesses and things that they are ashamed of. They had very tangible situations that put those to the test and they had very tangible ways that they were able to overcome them. And then the result of them overcoming that was good. If they were able to face it and overcome it, it got them closer to achieving their goal. And if they were not able to face it and overcome their internal struggle, they were farther away from achieving their goal. This was such a clever way to plot out the climax of that book because it allowed every single character's arc to be completed. They ended the book different than they were at the start of the book. And they had to do that in order to accomplish their main goal of the story. If one of them hadn't done it, they wouldn't have been able to accomplish their main goal of the story. And I just, I thought that that was so well done and so well put together. And what I'm gonna take forward from this big giant epiphany is that that's how I wanna plot the conflicts of, or the climaxes of my books going forward. I just did this when I was plotting the book or the third book in my series. I figured out what every single one of the things that my main four characters are dealing with during the story is. And I created specific events that would put that fear or weakness to the test. And then I had to find a way to string them all together in a sequence of events that made sense and got them each as they were able to face their worst fear closer to achieving their goal of the story. And I'm just like, I, I'm so jazzed about this climax. I think that it's going to be really cool. And I think that it's a perfect way to intersect character growth with story and plot conflict and everything. So that was the favorite piece of information about craft that I got out of Six of Crows. And yeah, that's all I have to say about that. Those are the things that I got out of reading Six of Crows. Those were the five main lessons about plot and character and pacing that I learned. If you read this book and you also loved it as much as I did, let me know in the comments, what was your favorite part of Six of Crows? Did you learn anything about writing from reading this book? I really mainly focused on plot and character in this video, but there are also a lot of things that you can learn about the way that Lee Bardugo writes and just the descriptions that she uses and the sentences that she uses are very, very cool. It's very different from my writing style, so I didn't really pay attention to that as much and really focused on like the actual uh, character and plot stuff. But if you are interested in like that kind of really creative fantasy, um, sensory, scenic language, 
definitely read this book because the prose is very, very good. It's rare that I read a book that makes me as invested in the characters as I was after reading this book. I haven't gone and like looked at fan art on Pinterest in a long time and I've been doing that with this book. Just the characters really stick in your head and just, I don't know, they, they, they stay with you. And I think that that is a really magical thing that she was able to do. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. As I mentioned before, my name is Claire Phrase and I'm an award-winning young adult author who makes videos on this channel sharing the actionable writing tips that helped me make my own writing better. I make a ton of craft videos and occasionally make videos on popular young adult books. This is upside down. So if you, are, if you like this, there will be more content like this coming your way. I hope you have a good week, everyone. And as always, happy writing.